The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash QCV860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, I'm Dr. Marwan Sabah. I'm the Camille and Larry Ruvo Chair for Brain Health and the Director of the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada. Welcome to this program titled Exploring Current Guidelines and Emerging Therapeutic Strategies for the Treatment of Dementia-Related Psychosis. Our first task is to understand, recognize, and diagnose psychosis in the context of dementia. And Alzheimer's dementia is the most common type of dementia, constituting two-thirds to three-quarters of all dementia. It is growing in prevalence with 5.8 million cases in the United States and uh, growing worldwide up to 15 million cases. And when you actually look at it from a breakdown, a million people at age 65 to 74, up to 2 million people, or 36% of the entire population of age 85 and older. Importantly, you understand that dementia is the category of the illness. Alzheimer's is a type of dementia, but the uh, category of uh, illnesses that include dementia include Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's dementia, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, mixed pathologies, and other types of dementia. But again, Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. An important complication and risk factor uh, of to progression is the presence of neuropsychiatric features such as hallucinations and delusions. The prevalence of psychotic symptoms and in, in patients with moderate to Alzheimer's dementia include uh, up to 70% of people with delusions and up to 33% of patients with hallucinations. So what is dementia-related psychosis? Dementia-related psychosis is the presence of hallucinations or delusions. Hallucination is a sensory perception occurring in the absence of corresponding stimuli. Simply put, seeing things that are not there, hearing things that are not there, or feeling things on their skin that are not there. When I see a well-described visual hallucination, I will often think of Lewy body dementia first. A delusion is a fixed false belief. It is thinking things that are going on, but they're not. Common delusions include people are stealing from me, my spouse is an imposter, I'm not in my own home, uh, and things like that. Uh, so these are very common neuropsychiatric features. The psychotic symptoms categorized in a large constellation of symptoms referred to as behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, or BPSD, also known as neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia, is which what I call them. Other BPSD symptoms include agitation, aggression, disinhibition, depression, and anxiety. Importantly that this audience understands, this is not just a complication of the dementia. It is not something that just causes caregiver distress, but in fact, uh, there, it is associated with accelerated cognitive decline, functional impairment, and mortality. The, the burden of DRP is very important, and you understand that it's a very distressing emergence of neuropsychiatric features, specifically both on, uh, on caregivers and on patients. I can tell you that patients in my world dement in two flavors, the happy demented and the agitated, paranoid, DRP-type uh, demented patient. The DRP patients tend to get placed in a, acute psychiatric units. They go into memory care. They, they, they uh, uh, have more morbidity and mortality. So it is a very distressing emergence. It has negative effects, including emotional, psychological, and financial problems, uh, and it causes huge emotional distress. I can tell you of, of all the things that caregivers deal with, the emergence of neuropsychiatric features by far and away is the thing that causes them the most distress, and it is a predictor, a very, very robust predictor of institutional, uh, institutionalization in residential facilities for patients with dementia because it exceeds caregiver uh, uh, ability to provide care. So who is at risk? What are the risk factors? And this is a slide that kind of walks you through a lot of things. But it's a couple things that are worth noting. One is that their sensory impairment is a risk factor. The second thing I want to talk about is social isolation. Patients who are not uh, uh, kind of in a structured social environment or having socialization tend to have more of this. 
Think about this current moment in time in our history. Uh, there you're seeing, of course, that Alzheimer dementia and other dementias are associated with social isolation to begin with, compound COVID-19, and a lot of my patients are literally at home for months on end, and they're having more behavioral problems as time goes on. The other thing is, of course, I think there are a lot of triggers, and this is the middle, lower box, talking about caregiver factors. I think that caregivers are often ill-equipped, ill-experienced, uh, and ill-trained on how to manage the emergence of neuropsychiatric features, and so that causes some problems. And then we're going to talk about some of the medical things that are associated with it. So this is a good time for us to think about a diagnostic evaluation for a patient with dementia and the differential diagnosis. Uh, medical ev evaluation is important, and it's important when you see a patient with psychosis. First thing I do is I don't go for an antipsychotic or a, a, a benzodiazepine. The first thing I do is I look at their medication list. Uh, I look at for offenders of their medications, anticholinergic medications, over-the-counter sleep aids, bladder medications. Anything that can affect their cognition can, in fact, cause emergence of neuropsychiatric features. Second thing I do is a medical evaluation. I look for vitamin deficiencies hypothyroidism, structural abnormalities, UTI. I would tell you how many times I've diagnosed somebody with UTI, it's amazing. Third thing I would do is I would check for sensory deprivation since poor vision can cause visual hallucinations and poor hearing can cause uh, uh, auditory hallucinations. I will tell you that I make note if they've had a history of psychiatric features, but that's not automatically where I go when I'm evaluating my patient. So what does the medical evaluation look like? First thing I would do is a lab work, urinalysis. I can't tell you how many times in my career I have treated UTIs. Uh, and you know, the funny part about it is when you see a patient with abrupt change in their dementia course or abrupt emergence of neuropsychiatric features, do the medical evaluation. Check a UA first. Do a CMP, look at metabolic panels, look at fasting glucose, look at liver functions, look at B12. Uh, so the point is, is that the laboratory evaluation would be imperative. The next thing I would do is an imaging evaluation, uh, CT or MRI, looking for uh, hydrocephalus, stroke, or mass lesions. Uh, and then I would do some kind of quantification of the neuropsychiatric features. We're going to talk about the NPIQ, also known as the Neuropsychiatric Inventory Questionnaire. But I want to say this before we move on to the next slide. The medical history is imperative. And so I take the time, and we'll talk about this later out throughout the talk, I take the time to figure out what is causing the behavior. How often does it occur? How long has it been going on? What's triggering it? Is it always at the same time in the day? I have patients who become agitated, even without dementia-related psychosis, because they don't even like, they're in institutional-based care, and they just don't like their roommate. Something simple like that. Or uh, uh, I try to figure out if it's part of a sundowning cluster or whatever they're, if they're resistant to ADLs, is it because they're paranoid and fearful uh, from the paranoia that uh, I've had patients who were afraid to take a shower because they thought that they would get burned from the water even though the caregiver was there to, and they had, a, they had a deep delusion that they were gonna die if they took a shower. So my point is, is that take a medical history, find out what's going on, find out the triggers, find out how often it occurs. So one thing I will tell you to do is do some kind of structured inventory. This is one of those we would recommend, the NPIQ, or Neuropsychiatric Inventory Questionnaire. It's developed and cross-validated with standard neuropsychiatric inventory to provide a brief assessment of 12 categories of neuropsychiatric symptomatology. So there is a large instrument called the NPI, or Neuropsychiatric Inventory. It's typically used in a clinical trial. I would not advise the NPI in clinical practice, and it's not routinely done. But the NPIQ is a short version of it and allows you to, to assess the type of frequency, severity, pattern, and timing of psychiatric symptoms, and then allow you to come up with symptom severity rating. Uh, it only takes about five to 10 minutes to complete and should be done with clinician input. So I will say to you, that would be something that can be done in clinical practice. So let's talk about a patient I actually had last week. This is an 80-year-old uh, right-handed female with 14 years of education who's brought in by her husband and adult daughter because she's having progressive cognitive decline for five years, starting with repeating herself, asking the same question and saying the same things over and over again, and misplacing objects. Over the last five years, she's progressed. She's no longer driving. She can no longer manage finances. She's burned things in, on the stove. She can no longer cook. Uh, she can no longer maintain the home, and she has uh, progressed into dementia. What has 
the family kind of accepted this was old age, and so they didn't really want to do anything about it until she started having this emergence of neuropsychiatric, neuropsychiatric features. Specifically, she would see her reflection in the mirror and start screaming, that's the woman having an affair with my husband. And she would get very, very agitated. The husband became fearful and started covering the mirrors uh, to avoid her seeing her own reflection. Sometimes when she was in a good mood, she would see her reflection and think that was a guest and invite them in and invite them to dinner. So it depended on what mood she was in. Either she was very agitated, thinking of a, a delusion of infidelity or from her own reflection or uh, in a benign, more benign uh, uh, feature. Her exam was pretty significant. She had a MOCA of 12. Her FAST, the functional assessment staging scale, was 6A, meaning that she needed supervision in getting dressed. Uh, her general physical exam was normal, except that she had been losing 20 pounds unintentionally in the last uh, two years. She appeared frail when I examined her. She did have Gegenhalt in tone, but otherwise unremarkable. I uh, thought that she needed an evaluation, including a parietal, uh, I did a PET scan, APUE genotype, B12, TSH, CMP, CBC. Uh, she had had outside imaging which showed no stroke tumor or hydrocephalus. B12, TSH were normal. APOE for carrier, FDG showing parietal temporal hypometabolism. My diagnosis was Alzheimer dementia, capgrass delusion, uh, capgrass delusion and dementia related psychosis. When we consider how to manage psychosis and agitation in Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, we should consider the International Delphi Consensus Committee. In 2017, the, an international expert panel was assembled to rank current and future pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments efficacious for three types of symptoms, BPSD symptoms overall, agitation, and psychosis. They considered uh, categories of all aspects. They looked at multiple, what it would consider be first line approach, second line, et cetera, and they rank ordered them. The consensus shows that identification of underlying causes of symptoms should occur prior to treatment of any kind for all types of symptoms. So do the medical evaluation before instituting treatment. Recommendations that div uh, diverge from BPSD overall and agitation and psychosis included non-pharmacological approaches were prioritized for BPSD overall and agitation and risperidone was prioritized for psychosis. In rank order considering the approach, the first consensus opinion said thorough assessment and management of underlying causes should be considered, followed by caregiver education and training and redirection strategies. Next, evaluate the environment and consider how the environment can be adapted. If there is sensory deprivation, improve the sensory deprivation. Next, consider a patient-centered care approach. Not, uh, in other words, a cookie-cutter approach doesn't work. Think about each patient individually and how you would tailor your program to them. Next, consider a tailored activity program. Idea that the patient should be awake in the daytime, having stimuli, having activities, and so that they can have a, a, a more stable structure. Next, consider an SSRI as a safer alternative to an antipsychotic as first-line pharmacological treatment after you've tried non-pharmacological treatments. Next, if there is evidence that the patient may have any discomfort, something simple like pain or constipation, treat that before you try something more advanced like a risperidone. The consensus on the current treatment of psychosis recommends thorough assessment and management of underlying causes first and risperidone second. But the committee looked not just at the present and gave recommendations about the present, they looked into the future. They looked and identified that there were several emerging candidates were discussed for future treatment of agitation and psychosis, also showing that differing approaches were highlighted for agitation in comparison to psychosis. So when you rank order the pharmacological treatments for agitation, dextromethorphan and quinidine combination was considered first, uh, followed by mirtazapine, and third, uh, the antihypertensive prazosin. For the emerging treatments for pharmacological treatments for psychosis, Pimavastin was considered first, followed by citalopram. And importantly, they did give recommendations for non-pharmacological treatments, including DICE and music therapy. So let's take the moment to talk about DICE. So what is DICE? DICE stands for Describe, Investigate, Create, and Evaluate. 
So I have to tell you, I practiced dice without even knowing that it was called dice. I practiced that in my own practice. When I talk about describe, we're talking about you know, taking the time to take a history. How often does it occur? When does it occur? What's the triggering? Does it occur every day at the same time? Uh, what is provoking the patient? Things like that. So really get a strong description of what is the trigger and the description of it. And then as we talked about, you should investigate medications, medica medical conditions, et cetera. Then you create a, a specific tailored program to that person, and then you evaluate whether it's working. So the DICE approach can be used to facilitate cooperation and communication between patient and caregiver and provider. It can be uh, used to assess the and determine whether the patient's in danger to themselves or others. It can also identify underlying causes of DRP symptoms, and it's used as a treatment uh, moment in time to educate the patient and the caregiver about what this is all about. Uh, and it also allows a checklist to consider whether pharmacological approaches are warranted, are they warranted first, or can you try redirection strategies first. The American Psychiatric Association guidelines on antipsychotic use in patients with dementia-related psychosis are very important for this audience to understand because there is a lot of risk associated with any atypical antipsychotics and not a lot of benefit. However, when you are a practitioner like I am, you're seeing a problem, right? There's an immediacy of the issue. Families want an effect, they want a treatment, they want a, a change now. They don't want to just wait weeks and months to see a, a change, they want to see it now. So there's an immediacy to these things. But there's also risks and benefits, and so you should discuss the risks and benefits with the caregivers before initiating treatment. Start at the lowest, lowest dose, usually whatever the lowest dose is on the label, I start at half of that. I look for side effects, EPS in particular, falls in particular, somnolence in particular, the three things I spend a lot of time looking for. If you're not seeing any benefit in four weeks, try to either increase the dose or stop it and replace it. And if they respond positively, keep them at that dose for a while and then start to taper it down. Uh, and then think about whether you want to keep this on the long term or want to try it only for a few months. You have to be thinkful, uh, thoughtful of the fact that the EPS the drugs uh, side effects are real. Antipsychotics have two mechanisms of action that actually make them work but cause the side effects. One is D2 receptor blockade, which ameliorates the positive symptoms. And the second thing it does is it causes 5H2 receptor blockade, which ameliorates the negative symptoms. But the consequence of this is that you'd see the emergence of uh, EPS extrapyramidal side effects, Parkinsonism. I can't tell you how many patients I've seen over and over again, even now in modern practice, that actually have clear re reproducible EPS as long-term consequences of the use of any atypical antipsychotics. Now that you, we have reviewed the mechanism of action, let me review with you that these classes of drugs do have black box warnings on antipsychotic use in the elderly. The black box warning should not be ignored, even though it's in our, in our, fa in our face, in our practice, and we see it to the point where we're almost tuning it out, antipsychotics in dementia-related psychosis do increase risk of death, stroke, Parkinsonism, sedation, gait disturbance, cognitive decline, weight gain, metabolic syndrome, and pneumonia. This is not an incidental or spurious things. There is clear evidence there is an increased risk for falls, increased risk for mortality, and when you look at it, this has been looked at for over two years, there's clear evidence that the longer the use, the more the risk. And so we should not ignore the risk of mortality when it comes to the use of these drugs. So as you're weighing risk, let me point out something that you may not be aware of, is that the drugs that you routinely use, meaning aripiprazole, olanzapine, quetiapine, and risperidone, have been studied in psychosis, in psychosis in the setting of dementia. And despite the black box warning, the evidence of efficacy is quite limited. In fact, if you look at the fourth column, you see the highlighted elements is that these drugs have very limited effects, either very small effects or non-significant effects, suggesting that we're getting a lot of, a very little benefit for a lot of risk. So a lot of side effects without a lot of effects. Well, we just said there are some risks more than benefits in the use of antipsychotics. What about other things? Well, let's talk about SSRIs as a potential alternative to antipsychotics and DRP. We think that they're good ideas, right? Many antidepressants facilitate serotonergic neurotransmission, which may improve behavioral symptoms. 
I will say to you that I often reach for an SSRI as my first-line treatment because I can potentially also get anxiolytic effects, mood effects, etc. Norepinephrine is also modulated by many antidepressants that are currently in use, and norepinephrine dysregulation is observed in dementia patients. Antidepressants have been suggested as po possible safer alternatives to antipsychotics for the treatment of dementia and psychosis in DRP, and there is some limited evidence that citalopram and escitalopram uh, perform just as well as risperidone in the, uh, to alleviate uh, and psychotic symptoms in patients with dementia in head-to-head -head comparison studies with superior safety and tolerability uh, compared to risperidone. So what I'm trying to say to you is maybe it's a good first-line choice before you reach for the risperidone. Uh, maybe you try an SSRI first like citalopram. But as practitioners, I would not forget or ignore the, fa the baseline drugs like memantine or cholinesterase inhibitors. The combination of memantine and cholinesterase inhibitors, going as far back as the Terrio article in 2004, shows that when you combine the uh, memantine and the cholinesterase inhibitors like dimnepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine, you can see reduction in attention ag agitation, hallucinations, delusions, irritability, lability, uh, aberrant motor behavior, nighttime behavior, and uh, uh, eating behavior, and uh, agitation in general. So my point is, is that you saw favorable symptoms at 12 and 24 weeks were statistically significant compared to just the use of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors alone. So that would be, I think, your first line choice. Try your, your staple acetylcholinesterase inhibitor and memantine, maybe then add an SSRI, maybe then if you're uh, uh, having treatment resistance, go to a drug that has been tried in the past, is risperidone. One drug I want to bring to the attention of this audience is a drug called meserpidine, a 5-HT6 serotonin receptor antagonist. It was studied in a phase two multicenter randomized double-blind placebo-controlled 26-week trial, uh, which was considered to be a proof of concept study in moderate Alzheimer's patients on background therapy. Patients were either randomized to one of three arms, meaning uh, meserpidine, 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, or placebo, in conjunction with background therapy, with the main outcome being the NPI. What you see on the figure is that the green line is the placebo, suggesting that the placebo group is getting worse over time after 26 weeks, but the meserpidine treatment group actually was stabilized or even improved on neuropsychiatric features after 26 weeks, and these changes were highly significantly, statistically significant. One thing you should consider is pimavanserin. Pimavacerin is a selective serotonin 5-HT it's inverse agonist. It has been FDA approved since 2016 for the treatment of delusions and hallucinations associated with PD-related psychosis. The advantage is, is that it has this inverse agonist property without dopaminergic, adrenergic, histaminergic, or muscarinic affinity. So there's been two studies that need to be thought of in this uh, particular uh, context. One is this RDBC trial. This is a trial done in long-term care. This is done by my colleague, Dr. Clive Ballard. He did this in patients with very severe uh, neuropsychiatric features in long-term care, nursing homes. These were re re residing, 181 patients residing. What he showed in the bottom left is that uh, patients who took uh, the pimavanserin had a 40% reduction in their uh, neuropsychiatric features uh, compared to placebo, which only had a 20% reduction, and that uh, difference was statistically significant. There were some AEs that are noted here. Unlike atypical antipsychotics, pimavanserin did not have a negative impact on cognitive function. This is important to consider because there are some, there is some evidence that the atypical antipsychotics uh, that we've been using may help, may or may not help their neuropsychiatric symptoms, but may have adver adverse effects on cognitive function. When the data from this study was looked even further, the patients with severe psychosis may have had even a more robust effect. Pre-specified subgroup analysis looked at patients with neuropsychiatric inventory or NPI psychosis, severe, meaning greater than 12 on their baseline. They found that they had a more robust effect with pimavanserin in reducing psychosis. At week six in the, in the graph, you see that wh whether it was 20% improvement, 30% improvement, or 50% improvement, there was statistically significant benefit compared to placebo, no matter how severe or how much improvement occurred. 
So on the basis of that phase two trial, investigators designed the phase three Harmony trial. This is a double-blind placebo-controlled study of 34 milligrams of pimvastatin once a day in dementia-related psychosis. Let me walk you through this slide because it's important you understand the design. These are patients who are about 75 years old, ranging from 50 to 90, from mild dementia to severe dementia, 6 to 24 on the mini-mental, all meeting the NAIA criteria for dementia, all-cause dementia, including Lewy body, PD-related psychosis, Alzheimer's dementia, FTD, et cetera. They had to have severe psychosis, and they had to have symptoms for at least two months and were stable on background therapy. All of these patients, that's almost 400 patients, were uh, assigned to open-label pimavastrin for 12 weeks. After 12 weeks, the people who were considered to be responders uh, were then randomized one-to-one -one pimavastrin to placebo, looking then at the time to relapse rate. It's important to understand that this cohort is quite impaired, right? These are up to 80% of people with hallucinations and up to 85% uh, of patients with delusions. So these are not mildly impaired people. They're quite impaired. Importantly, again, to understand that all, every patient got the open label treatment. Then if they were considered to be a responder, they were then in, put into a blinded phase and randomized to either pimavastatin or placebo. In the 12-week open label phase, 62% of eligible participants, that's a, of the 351, met sustained treatment response criteria at week eight and week 12 and entered the double blind period. Pimavastatin reduced psychotic symptoms by 75.2% across all subtypes of DRP during open label phase. Following the open label period, patients who met pre-specified criteria for treatment response were then randomized into the double blind period to continue the pimavastatin or switch to placebo and followed for up to 26 weeks. What happened, which was great, is that pimavastatin met its primary endpoint and was stopped in the pre-planned interim analysis for efficacy, demonstrating that pimavastatin significantly reduced risk for relapse of psychosis by almost threefold compared to placebo, and that was highly statistically significant. Since that has occurred, the uh, company has applied for a indication and label through an NDA uh, to the FDA for treatment of dementia-related psychosis. A breakthrough therapy designation was granted for pemvastatin in 2017 for this indication. The drug ha is pretty safe and has pretty good side effects profile. Importantly, there is no adverse effects on cognition. There is some evidence that there is some increased UTI, a little bit of constipation, a little bit of headache, uh, but generally it's a very well tolerated drug. The conclusions here are one, dementia related psychosis is common. It is important, it warrants the physician attention, it is important to uh, warrant physician evaluation and treatment. Two, is that these symptoms cause considerable caregiver distress and often lead to institutionalization in long-term care facilities. Three, caregiver education can benefit both patients and caregivers. Talk about redirection strategies. Talk about ways to uh, guide patients' families on how to respond. I'll tell you a good example of this. Oftentimes, my patient, you know, when they say, well, dad's coming to visit. Well, your dad's been dead for 50 years. Well, Patients should be taught to say, or caregivers should be taught to say, oh, we'll go visit dad tomorrow, or do what we call a redirection strategy. So caregiver education is really important. Next, given the severity and frequency of these symptoms and the lack of current FDA-approved treatment for DRP, many classes of drugs have been utilized off-label to treat these distressing symptoms of dementia. Treatments should be tailored to each patient with some consideration for the potential serious side effects. So take your time to figure out what's the trigger. Don't use a cookie cutter approach. Think about uh, what works for each individual patient. Try the drugs with fewer risks and side effects first uh, before escalating. And then good news for us is that there are new therapeutic targets that are emerging with better efficacy and safety profile. We hope to see drugs like pimavastatin are approved and reimbursed uh, very soon so that we can start using them. That ends our discussion for today. I hope you found it informative and useful for your practice. Thank you. Thank you for listening. 
Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash QCV860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Incorporated. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.